When you get a bonus, how long does it take you to think about the next bonus? I will never be an employee anymore. We all go through it, let's be frank. People don't understand when you are choosing a business partner, it's like you're marrying. They would choose one entrepreneur who failed a lot. Every day, remember to pee. Have some me time. We all forget to take our vitamins. But do we ever forget to take our painkillers? Are you selling painkillers or vitamins? Hire slow, fire fast. I was bankrupt twice, and being bankrupt means there's no food on the table. We can't survive much. You are the average of the five people you interact with the most. Just take action. Hey everyone, welcome to a new episode of the AI Best Business Show, the show where you'll learn about business, entrepreneurship, tech. Today I have with me Andre Abi Awad. Uh, Andre, I'm going to start this podcast in a different way today. If we were to leave the, if we were to cut the podcast short into two minutes, what's something you would tell the audience that they would take as a message and that would change their life? I usually work with entrepreneurs and uh, to make it very brief, I say, if you have an idea, don't fall in love with it. Don't fall in love with your solution. Just go and sit with your target audience. Make sure you are solving a pain. Uh, give them the painkiller as they want it, not a vitamin, and you're going to make a great business. And make sure you think marketing because people build products and services and they don't think about marketing marketing is very important because you need to also work on your positioning unfair advantage and competitive advantage and good luck i'm gonna take all that and i'm gonna speak about each part of it but before that i want to know who's andre uh, i've been uh, in the entrepreneurship ecosystem for the past 15 years uh, since 2008 as uh, a trainer in in entrepreneurship but as an entrepreneur, I started in, I was 16 years old. I started doing websites because I didn't like uh, one day I went to work at the hotel to get some pocket money and I didn't like it. Then I capitalized on what I love to do. And I used to code HTML using notepad back wow. then. Okay. And uh, I sold my first website. It was actually a check was $100 and I couldn't cash it out. So I still have a photocopy of that check till, till today because my dad had to cash it out for me. <laughs> uh, that was when I started the, the entrepreneurial, uh, let's say virus in my, in my brain and my body in my life. And uh, then I graduated as an engineer. I worked as an engineer. Then I was promoted to be in sales because I always worked on improving myself. Uh, I had a, a long career, but 8 August 2014, I said I will never be an employee anymore. And since then, I started Entrepreneurgy, which is a large community of Arab entrepreneurs. We have more than 5,400 members in it. We uh, It started as a podcast, by the way, and uh, we were on iTunes for 16 weeks, number one podcast in, in, in here, the oh. Arab region mostly. We had uh, 270,000 unique listeners back then, 2014, 2015, from 132 countries uh, wow. on iTunes. And then we started doing events to connect entrepreneurs to opportunities. Uh, I had my own trainings. I work with all the entrepreneurship ecosystem. And since 2008 until now, I've trained in 54 countries, 36 out of them physically and the others online and i currently work with entrepreneurs and i advise business owners wow i i love that when is, is it still a podcast do you still uh, do you still do episodes and interview founders or have you stopped that we 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 stopped the podcast in 2015 and we started okay. doing offline events mm -hmm. we had uh, panels i interviewed i interviewed so far more than 700 successful business owners in the arab world I'm currently interviewing 100 entrepreneurs in Lebanon because we did an event on the 25th of February, 2023, where it was called 100 Entrepreneurs Gathering. I gathered 100 early stage entrepreneurs, not in the idea stage. They all have traction. They all have employees. But like in the first three years, 
plus of their business. And uh, now I'm interviewing them because we're going to launch an ebook with 100 interviews, 100 entrepreneurs, and the lessons uh, learned from them. Wow, I, I I love the widespread of entrepreneurs you've met, and I think you there's a lot of knowledge in meeting all these different trajectory entrepreneurs and where they are in the journey and learning from them, and you adding knowledge to them. Uh, you mentioned entrepreneur entrepreneurgy. Is that how you say it? Yes. yes. Where did the idea spark from? Like mm -hmm. what was happening? And we're like, okay, I need to start it. Uh, mm -hmm. How did it come to life? I was bankrupt twice starting my own business. Uh, first time I was 26, second time I was 29. And then I said, okay, this can't go forever. And uh, being bankrupt, actually, I came from a very poor family. And I was the one who's taking care of the family because no one uh, was working other than me. And being bankrupt means there's no food on the table. So I said, there's something wrong and I need to know what it is. Then I took uh, Jim Rohn's quote that I really love. It says, you are the average of the five people you interact with the most. Okay. So I said, let's, let's make this in practice. And I made sure to be close to five entrepreneurs, at least singing, meeting, talking with one of them every week for a year. Until 8 August 2014, I said, I will never be an employee anymore. I wrote it online. It's still there. And I launched Entrepreneurgy. It's energy for entrepreneurs. Because when I was bankrupt, I went into, I, I call it self-diagnosed depression because I didn't go to a, uh, to, to, to a doctor. I didn't take pills. I didn't go through treatment. But you know, when you're sleeping all day, you have no energy, you don't do anything. And actually, the first time, the only time, the only reason I get up from my bed is when the bank called and says, you're late for the loan payment, because it was a bank loan, I lost it in eight months, I had to repay it for five years. Wow. And I said, if I learned the mindset, the habits, the tactics, the strategies, of successful business owners, I need to give it back to everyone else, especially in my community, because you cannot imitate Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg in a region, in the Arab region, in the MENA world also, and say, I'm going to be successful. It's a total different environment, total different setup, infrastructure, and everything. So that's why I started interviewing Arab entrepreneurs. And I got that mindset, habits, and tactics, and everything they taught me that I transfer to other entrepreneurs now. Okay. If, if we would take these events you've done or these interviews you've done, what are two or three lessons that stood out to you or a success story from an entrepreneur that really stood out to you that like, okay, that's a wow, and that's something I'll never forget? Well, talking about success stories, it's going to be hard to define one, two, or even three, because from the hundreds, I, I learned a lot. But uh, let me categorize it. Once you are starting your business, or you have an idea, it's very important to take action. And I always have this bracelet in my hand. Just take action. action. Wow. Because people talk. But those who take action are like a very small percentage of, of people will take action. So take action. And what type of actions? Anything that can get you closer to your target audience and a clarity about the problem and your business model. That's very important uh, if you are starting. Second, when you start, make sure you have a very solid and alive business model. What do I mean by that? Make sure you understand your business model from all its perspective and make sure it's alive, which means sometimes you have to update it daily and sometimes you have to just review it weekly or monthly because the market is always changing. The behavior of your customers are is always changing. Uh, the strategies, the channels, the relationship, the infrastructure, activities, resources, everything is changing. And 
I, I believe that one of the great mindsets I've got from amazing entrepreneurs is the power of partnerships. And when I say partnerships, it's not about uh, those who have equity in your business, but those who are your suppliers, your uh, uh, third party logistics, those who you outsource to partner with so they can take off your plate. Because once you start, most of the time people start as solopreneurs. And you can't do everything alone. And it's very important to understand when is the time to start hiring because you don't want to be in to, to go into burnout. And we all know about the entrepreneurial burnout. They suffer, entrepreneurs, they suffer from it very silently. And I also learned that from uh, business owners. We all go through it, let's be frank, but it's very important to be aware and have some me time, have some balance as much as you can. We know entrepreneurs, it's hard to get the balance, but right. as much as you can in order not to be burned out. I, I love this and I agree with this. I'm going to give an example of myself. Well, my first startup was a crowdfunding platform. I came into it. I'm like, okay, that's going to be the next Kickstarter in the Arab world. I contacted a development agency. I paid $10,000. That was, and I was 21 at this time building the dream app i wanted to build alone i'm like i'm not sharing equity with anyone <clears throat> two months it failed and that was a wake-up call i'm like okay you're doing something wrong this gave me a lesson started my next startup e-commerce platform a e-commerce website uh i got a partner with me who's good at what i'm not good at and we built that and we were able to get revenue and then we sold it so that was a lesson for me that always build a team build a successful team around you, you'll get to success easier than when you take that path alone. So I, I love that lesson. Mm -hmm. And to comment, uh, Ahmed, on, on this one, my second bankruptcy, it was because of my partner. Wow. And <laughs> I learned from it. Uh, I was a speaker at a Facebook mm -hmm. event in 2019 and one lady asked me, uh, I'm breaking up with my partner. I'm losing the business now and I want to start another one with another partner. So what's your... Uh, what's your advice? Uh, you know, when sometimes you get creative with the answer and I've got that answer when I said, you are starting a new business, you want to achieve victory. And this is the victory sign. At the same time, it's number two and it's the letter V. So whenever you are partnering with someone, you need to have the two Vs. You need to have the same values because whenever you have any misunderstanding, any decision values will help you be on the same page and you need to have the same vision because whenever you are growing you don't want each partner to go on a different road you need to be aligned with your vision and that's the most basic part of choosing a partner because people don't understand when you are choosing a business partner it's like you're marrying yes. and being married to to someone it's not easy to divorce yes when it's a business. So it's very hard. I definitely agree. Choosing the right partner and just sitting with that partner, as you said, seeing the values you guys want, have and seeing what's your common goal in the future, because you may have a different goal. You may want to take that startup and exit. He may want to just do five, $6,000 a month and be happy with that. So if exactly. your goals are not aligned, you won't get where you want to be. You spoke a lot about, okay, starting a business, take action to it. I want to take this process of when an entrepreneur or and you as meeting all these entrepreneurs and having all this knowledge, I come to you, uh, Ahmad, I have a business idea or something. What's a, framing, a framework you would give me? So to tell me, Ahmad, you're on the right path. Like what's a framework when I'm choosing an idea that I should follow to know that this is a right idea or not? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In a very brief way, I use the three M's and uh, I always talk about them. The first M is the market uh, for your service and your product. Do you have enough people who are looking for it? Do you have the market? Do you know the market size? And when we're talking about market, it's not only about knowing if there are people interested in this product or service. It's do you know the channels to reach these people from awareness to acquisition and return pass and everything. If you don't know how to reach them, how are you going to sell your product and service? That's also in the market. Also in the market, 
are you selling painkillers or vitamins? We all forget to take our vitamins. I just remember that I myself today, I forgot to take my vitamin. <laughs> but do we ever forget to take our painkillers? No. No. And it's not about selling a product that people will die if they don't buy it. It's about positioning your product as a painkiller for a certain need or a certain uh, want that they are looking for. And I give an example. Those who are buying the GoPro, for example, it's not because it's the best camera. And we all know that there are many better cameras than the GoPro in the, in the market. Sure. But GoPro positioned themselves that when you have a GoPro, you look adventurous. Huh? And uh, Louis Vuitton bags. Do you really want to buy a ten thousand plus dollar uh, bag? You can have any bag, but there's a social status that people want to maintain, and it's about self-expression. And self-expression is a need. Also, an Apple product, watch, iPhone, everything, Mac. Uh, people are getting these products. It's not because. They will die if they are not getting it. But this brand positioned this product in a way that caters to a very specific target audience and solves, let's call it a pain for them. That's uh, okay. in the market. No, no, go that, ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, that, that's in the market. Uh, two, it's margin, which is profit margin. Did you do the right study to, to know that your costs and your revenue will make your business sustainable, which means will your revenue be more than your cost in order for yourself to have this profit margin that will sustain your business? Because many people, they fall in love with the business. They don't do the feasibility study nor the financial study, and they are losing money while operating the business. That's the second M. And the third M actually... We should always start with it, but I end with it because it has a very important point, which is me, the third M, yeah. my lifestyle. Does this business fit my lifestyle? I have many examples and stories about that, but I'll give a very simple uh, example that happened with one in, in, in one of my workshops, and I'll make it very short. So a girl was starting a coffee shop tailored for students. She saw that concept in London and she wanted to duplicate it in Lebanon. She got a design. Every week I asked them, what have you done to move towards your goal? So she got a designer. She got a consultant of FNB and he wanted to be her partner. Uh, she met suppliers with very good pricing. She, she found a venue. Her father wanted, saw her enthusiasm. He wanted to inject $50,000 to help her. Uh, she started the design. She, saw, she showed us the brand identity. Uh, she got many things. And then I said, what have you done so far? What have you done this week to move towards your goal? And she said, I'm going to stop. Wow. We're like, you have everything. He said, yeah, when I met with Samer, the FNB consultant, he told me this week that whenever we open the business, I should be from the moment we open the doors to the moment we close the doors. But I'm starting a business in order to generate revenue and travel the world. That's nice. so just imagine. It doesn't fit the lifestyle. And other businesses, like one of the businesses I was partner with, but I was not an active partner. The guy uh, had a new child and a daughter. And after four months, he came to us. He said, look, guys, none of you want to stay in the business. And every night, the time I want to play with my daughter, uh, feed her, uh, take her to sleep. I'm sitting in the business. I don't want my daughter to grow without me. So we have to sell the business. And it was profitable. We had the market, we had the margin, but the lifestyle, the me, was not there. So mainly assess yourself on the three M's and then you take other steps to grow and start the business. Oh. I like the me part. I don't think a lot of people uh, pay attention to it or mention it, but I think it's one of the most important parts when you go into a business. Decide what type of business you want to get into and what the lifestyle you want to live out of this business. 
we got to a place where, okay, now you gave me the three me's. I assessed them. I did my feasibility study. I started that business. I have my co-founder, uh, which I chose depending on value and where we aligned together. We started this business. I come back to you. I'm like, after three months, I'm like, Andre, my marketing isn't working. What what can I do? What marketing channels can I look for? How can I approach the market? Like, what are marketing tips uh, you would give for me to attain a customer and keep that customer so I don't lose that customer? How can I retain that customer after I marketed to him and got him to be my customer at this startup? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. For me, there is no one answer to this question. Because my, one of my companies that I've sold last year was in digital marketing, and we used to do lead acquisition for SaaS companies. That was very specific service. If you tell me what's the marketing strategy for a SaaS company, what's the marketing strategy for a restaurant, what's the marketing strategy for a tourism uh, uh, company, I would say we can't apply the same to, to all of them. But... What I believe, and I always say it, and I've said it like maybe five times so far in, in, in this interview, you need to be close to your target customers and understand where they search for such a product or such a service. Okay. How do they take the decision? Is it influenced by others or is it themselves? How do they assess this? Uh, we know the KLT, people... They need to know you, like you, trust you in order to buy from you. So you can't do all of these three in one interaction. You need to add value, establish the relationship, and then ask for the sale. I call this every day, remember to P, P-E-A, uh, provide value, establish relationship, and then ask. And this happens in networking. I use it in networking, and I also use it in sales because... People will not buy from someone they don't trust. And I'm, we're not talking about commodities here. We're just talking about like a real business, maybe B2B business. You need to understand your customer behavior, your customer journey. And it one tip, please dissect and, and re-engineer the customer journey. I rarely see entrepreneurs talking about the customer journey, which is... Uh, Seriously, <laughs> the customer journey is like every interaction with your business. And it goes on social media, it goes on the email, it goes on the website, it goes on the uh, maybe SMS, WhatsApp, people, uh, what marketing material you are using, billboards, anything. The customer journey, how they are talking to you, communicating with your team and everything. This is very important and you need to cater for your target customers. We, you can see now like McDonald's, they introduced like a couple of years ago, not now, they introduced uh, screens in their, in their uh, outlets because the new generation, they don't want to interact with people. They just want to go into McDonald's, order, order. on a screen, take their order and just go sit. They knew how to adapt to their customer segment. So in marketing, I love marketing, by the way. And I tell you, people don't understand marketing. When they put a post on social media and they boost it, they say, I did marketing. This is not marketing. This is a simple promotion. That's it. Marketing is a strategy. When, when you think about advertising, promotion, uh, a public relations, uh, sales, uh, uh, and now, uh, like everything, and you plan it, that's the marketing. It's not like putting a post and just posting and boosting it. This is not marketing. I have a funny story here. Before that crowdfunding platform, during COVID, I started a dropshipping clothing brand. And I went out, designed perfect designs. I went out, I took pictures of myself wearing them. I got fashion models, took pictures. And I, I knew nothing about entrepreneurship or marketing or like Facebook ad, customer segmentations, who's your market. There was even a show on Netflix, uh, Selling Sunset, where I was able to get with the uh, actors on the show and got them to wear my masks. But all I did is take these pictures, put them on the Instagram page. I had an Etsy website, and then I started boosting them. 
and I couldn't sell because that's not what marketing is. And it's it's a failure after failure where this failure helped me learn what marketing is. So when I came to my next e-commerce website, I knew what ads are. I knew how to use TikTok. I knew how to get uh, customer interactions. I knew how to do the customer journey and I, and I was successful with it. So I, I, you're very re- relatable to anyone that's hearing us because every entrepreneur who's starting a business, his first business looks like, I don't know anything. And then you start moving on and progressing and learning more. Uh, and never uh, uh, never discount the branding aspect also yes yeah branding they think that when they create a logo that's a branding it's, it's not okay a... that's another <laughs> subject <laughs> yes okay and now i figured out my marketing i went i continued building i came back after four or five months i'm like andre my team isn't motivated i can't mm. motivate my team how can i motivate my team you know uh, many many different ways to uh, to motivate uh, the team yet i one of the ways that i really love is writing appreciation letters very specific appreciation appreciation letters and and i'm talking about small businesses like up to let's say 12 20 employees not like corporates of 100 and and 1000 entrepreneurs maybe maybe at that time every manager or every senior would do it for their team but basically when we're starting and you're saying after five months or a year most probably you're not more than 10 20 employees and when i say writing appreciation letters it's handwriting not typing and printing handwriting and it it worked wonders for me. I even know that most of my employees, they had it uh, in their in their bedroom, like on a, on a on a board, uh, wow. in their di- diaries, and they showed it to me, and it was like a source of motivation to all of them. That's one. Before I go to the very important lesson, each individual is motivated in a different way, and you cannot apply motivation to all your team members in the same way only the appreciation letter is very important and i say do it for everyone but everything else it depends on your team members and that's why you need to also be close to them not to mix business and personal but to understand who is your team like you need to know with each individual what motivates them some people are motivated by continuous development some people are motivated by a title by the way, in my in my company, I don't care about titles. I tell them you can even use CEO. No one uses it, but you can even use CEO. I don't care if you're happy using it. Just use it. Uh, so, continuous development. Uh, sometimes the title. Uh, many times people think that money is is a source of motivation, but I know and I always test my assumption when you get a bonus how long does it take you to think about the next bonus the instantly. moment after you, right the moment after you get paid it. yes instantly like <laughs> directly <laughs> maybe 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 when you reach home you think uh, okay so i got uh, two salaries today i think maybe next time they should give me 2.5 <laughs> you're thinking about the next one so uh, understand each of your team members what motivates them that's that's in 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 a very uh, specific way to each member also in the culture and here i know that most people and especially at the early stage entrepreneurs don't take care of building a culture in the a business uh, building the culture, of course, it's a it's a wide topic. It's it's it takes time, but also when you understand your values and you hire based on your values, you have better culture and you have better coherent team, and they will help you. Uh, in addition, I have one one sentence that I always have in mind, and I say it to entrepreneurs: hire slow, fire fast. And hiring slow means even if you are a startup, even if it's the first employee, 
have at least three interviews. Of course, each interview has different ways of tackling it, different things to discover in the person, but hire slow, fire fast. And if you can try them in a project, for example, now I'm hiring a copywriter and I'm hiring a video editor. I gave them like one piece of content for both of them, actually for four, like two editors and two, uh, two copywriters after interviewing them. Now we're waiting for, for, for the result. And based on that result, after my team member, the business development manager interviewed them and I interviewed them, now the test, we will see who to hire. So hire slow and fire fast and create a culture based on your values and know each one, how they get motivated, write appreciation letters and you have a better business. I love, I love the appreciation letter. Uh, I, I'm, I work at a company here and we're almost 200, 300 employees and the CEO still writes an, a, a happy birthday letter wow. hand, handwritten Amazing. for each employee. So uh, yes, I got, it, I got it last year on my birthday. I'm like, wow, he knows wow. when my birthday is. And that <laughs> left an effect in me. So I motivated my team. I went, I have everything perfect five, six years from now. Uh, and I come back, I give you a call. I'm like, Andre, what does what should success look like me? Should I exit? Should I give my business that's profitable? What are the type of success that an entrepreneur should think of after mm. four, three, four, five years of success of success in his business? Mm, mm, mm. Uh, interesting question because uh, what entrepreneurs forget to plan for and and think about is the exit strategy, and I believe the exit strategy at least consider it i'm not i'm not saying it will stay the same every every year and after 5 years but at least consider it before you start your business and that's one of the lessons by the way i learned from my mentor and i learned from many entrepreneurs that i've interviewed many of them i'm not going to say most because this is not common and i hope it becomes common Many of them, they thought about their exit strategy before starting the business, when they were planning uh, the business. And also for exiting, there's no one answer for that. Uh, I'm an advisor for many businesses, uh, and we're talking about multi-million dollar, multinational uh, businesses. And I work directly with the business owner, so I'm not a consultant working in the business. I'm an advisor working with the business owner. And I can tell you, Currently, with my current clients, I usually have six business owners at the same time. Every time I finish with someone, there's a pipeline that uh, I, I, I onboard another person. Currently, within these six, one of them is looking for investment to scale. They are not exiting now. Okay. One of them is restructuring the business in order to exit, and they already have someone who's a strategic acquirer, that's why we're working on that. One of them is growing the business. It's a holding. Now we are creating the eighth company under that holding. Wow. So he's not exiting. He just wants to grow a holding with many uh, arms that are companies under that. Uh, some people, uh, one actually guy, is trying to make the business scalable using his management so i expect later on he's going to be the chairperson and the management will have a ceo and and so on so many ways of exiting you need to consider them early on and one important thing that happens for example i'm the advisor for a chairperson of a company uh, she's a lady the sad thing is that when when she took over the business after her father stepped out, he came back. Okay. And it... that wasn't easy. And that's why I say you need to think about the exit strategy. And when, when I'm working with a business owner who's leaving, he's, who's exiting and handing over uh, maybe second generation, maybe the management team, I tell them, please have something to do. Some of them launch NGOs, some of them go have their hobbies, 
Uh, some of them uh, relocate just to have peace of mind with their family, uh, anything, but please don't come back to the business and ruin everything after you've handed out uh, the business. So many exit strategies. Uh, some 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 questions, Ahmad, I can't say there's one answer to them. And it's very important to be tailored to every person and what their lifestyle, the me. Right. No, I bet. I agree with you. And uh, we spoke about that before the podcast that I have a newsletter uh, about cars and that I started at the beginning of this year. And I've seen many newsletter businesses. I've seen newsletters that have sold for a hundred million dollars and more. And we could say that the playbook is known uh, what you could do to, to succeed in a newsletter. And when I started, I'm like, okay, I could write a newsletter about cars every single day. But if I plan on exiting, I need a team and I need to start thinking strategically because no one is going to come and buy a business with a one person team. That's so, for sure. Yes. That's so, for what sure. I, so what I did, I hired a writer to start with me, even if I don't need them, but I hired them to start with me. They could write three newsletters a week. I write three newsletters a week. And then once, once we start going, I start adding to the team. So when I get to my goal after a year or two, I have a team set in place and I'm I'm positioning myself right to exit in the way I want. So I I love this. Start thinking about it early. Identify your goal. Identify your 10. And then go ahead and step on one, two, three, four to get to that 10. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm I sold my startup. I exited. Uh and I know you're a great connector. You have this huge network of people you've connected with, entrepreneurs you've connected with. And now I took that step back after I sold my business and I'm successful. I have the money in the bank and I want to build that network. What are three advices you'd give me to build that network? Uh, you want to build a network of entrepreneurs to support them or you want to build like to support professional to support them to have to just expand my network support these entrepreneurs or have a professional network around me people i could mm. go learn from or people i could advise and give learning to mm-hmm. you know the the easiest way is to look for uh, aspiring entrepreneurs who are starting in your industry the industry where you operated earlier mm. uh, because you're going to add a lot of value to okay. to these people and uh, mentoring entrepreneurs, like I mentor many entrepreneurs and I love it because it's like giving back from your experience. And sometimes it's uh, it's rewarding because you can, you can see that if they do this, it happened on Thursday, like yesterday. Uh, I was, I was uh, training a group of entrepreneurs and I saw, I, I asked them, what have you done this week to move towards your goal? And I saw that three of them are doing a big mistake. So instead of only me giving them the advice, I directly texted two entrepreneurs, two business owners, like very established, well-established business owners. And I said, I'm in the middle of a training session on Zoom. Can you join for 10 minutes? And I had two business owners joining the, the, Zoom, uh, the Zoom session. And they gave the advice that I really wanted the entrepreneurs to know, but I didn't want them to take it only from me because, you know, sometimes when you know the person, you take them for granted, especially when it's been a while and it's been like two months we're in this program. It's important to see others uh, doing this. That's why I have a big network of business owners around me and entrepreneurs because we, we all support each other. And whenever you are starting to grow a community it's important to look into the same industry because you're going to add value and look into entrepreneurs who are starting because you can you can give them a lot of value even if they are not in your industry maybe you can mentor them maybe you can uh, I, I don't like guide them because a mentor does not guide literally but they just uh, tell you stories, ask you questions. That's what I love about my mentors. And it will it will tickle your brain. It will shift right. your perspective sometimes and it will give you a, a lot of value. Uh, incubators, accelerators will be looking for you because you've already exited a business. So they will support you. And if you have enough money and you would like to uh, 
uh, to support more than advice, uh, maybe join an angel uh, investor uh, network mm -hmm. because right. it will also be rewarding, not only support with uh, your journey. I, I love that advice. Uh, I want to know more about you. Let's say now you drop everything you're doing and you're, I tell you, find the problem and build a startup around it. What would that startup be? I'll tell you about two startups that I'm doing now, I'm creating okay. now. And uh, both of them, they are very new. And uh, I didn't launch any of them because it's like a side thing that I'm exploring. Uh, what, I've been training on pitching for the past 13 years. Right. And I've trained one-on-one -on -one entrepreneurs, like not in a group, like a one-on-one -on -one, uh, session more than 2,700 entrepreneurs. Wow. And uh, most of my training, because I get hired by accelerators and incubators and universities and entrepreneurship competitions, most of what I was training on is pitching. That's why I work closely one-on-one -on -one, to create an investable uh, pitch, like a pitch for investment, uh, mostly. And... I, I discover a lot that entrepreneurs, many of them, they start the business because they know the technical part. They are an engineer, uh, a good chef, uh, anything. They, they know the technical part, but in terms of management and the entrepreneurial growth and so on, they struggle in it, especially the marketing. We just mentioned the marketing earlier. And they don't know how to convey the right message about their business that's why based on my and training about pitching i developed my own school of pitching i'm not it's not a school but like it's the methodology right. of pitching and uh, based on that i'm creating a startup now it's called uh, genie pitch which is generating your storyline and that's a very important tip to entrepreneurs because they just talk about their slides and they forget to create a connected storyline. It will create your storyline from whatever input you deliver about your business, about your idea, problem, solution, market size, and so on. And it's based on AI, of course. So okay. that's the first one. I like it. The second one is also because my earliest startup was about lead generation. The second, the second startup is lead generation tailored to Twitter, but now we're putting it a little bit on hold because Elon Musk is changing a lot in Twitter and we're not coping. So we're waiting <laughs> until it, like things are getting steady somehow until we uh, do it again. But the gene, uh, genie pitch is on the road. We still have, we, we actually tried it, the beta version with many entrepreneurs. They loved it. Mm -hmm. And now we're fine tuning it and we're launching it hopefully in April. I can't wait till you launch it and we could all get to use it. Mm -hmm. uh, seeing all these entrepreneurs around you, I have, I'm getting to my last two questions. So seeing all these entrepreneurs around you, what's a business or who's an entrepreneur you'll bet your money on? If you had an investment fund today, you had $10 million to invest and you, you're going to invest all these $10 million in one startup or one founder. Who would that, which startup or which founder would you invest in? I would choose one entrepreneur who failed a lot. Okay. And I, I mean it, who failed a lot and who have skin in the game. Like they started the new, their current business from their, from their money. Uh, they uh, bootstrap, they uh, collected money maybe from, uh, they raised money from uh, their family and friends in order to reach the stage where they validated their business model. They are growing. They built this, institution in, in the business and the team and now they are raising funds I'm gonna give them all my money okay uh, any specific industry uh, tech uh, restaurants any, any industry uh, you, I prefer you and and uh, actually I have it on my uh, on my planner mm -hmm. it's like a sticky note to keep it in mind uh, I prefer to invest in industry that I know about. Okay. And when I say I know about, it means that at any point, if the founders or the board got in trouble or a crisis hit the business, if I had, because you don't have to as an investor, but if I had to step in and be 
active in the the startup i should have at least the right people in my network to to support me or i should know a little bit about the business in order for me to maybe maybe reinvent the strategy and make it uh, grow again okay my last question what's <clears throat> again let's say you drop everything and you have one problem and your mission in life is going to be solving that one problem what is that one problem you'd want to give all yourself to and how can people help wow. you solve that problem wow <laughs> that's an amazing question <laughs> uh, never thought of it uh, uh wow interesting you know maybe maybe i'm affected because i i, I just watch a documentary about nature and i have a big love for nature uh, maybe it's about uh, saving saving uh, nature animals I, I love animals i have a dog also uh, maybe saving nature and animals because i believe if we keep on uh, moving forward with all these I'm going to call it ignorance from some people, uh, maybe industries and, and people. And we don't take care of our Mother Earth, nature, animals, environment, uh, uh, everything that is related to our uh, Earth and nature. Uh, we can't survive much. So okay. I believe this is one of the problems that I would love to dedicate myself to and my support to if... I have only one problem to solve. <laughs> if if you were to give a call of action to someone who's listening to us to help solve that problem, what would that call of call to action be? Uh, start yourself. For example, <laughs> okay. uh, I live I live in a country where most people don't sort their waste. Yes. I sort my waste. I consume responsibly, <laughs> and uh, I take care of my environment. Start with yourself. Indre, amazing episode. Uh, I had some questions that I have planned, but how the episode went and how we started talking took us in a different way. I really felt comfortable in this chat. I really learned a lot from you. Uh, where could people follow more of what you're doing? How could people find you more on social media or learn more or get uh, uh, approach you or contact you? Feel free. Mm -hmm. Uh, you have my name on the episode. You have my name here on the screen. Uh, people can connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm mostly active uh, on LinkedIn. I also have a newsletter on LinkedIn, The Freedom Owner. It's about piece of information that can help any entrepreneur or business owner to gain their freedom while growing the value of their business and scaling it. You can follow me on LinkedIn mostly, and I'm always active there. Andre, thank you one more time for being here.